The UK would only be able to fight Russia for two months, according to the country's deputy chief of the defense staff. And Germany could do so only for two days, due to the lack of ammunition on hand. This is while the world's geopolitical situation is the worst it's been in over three decades, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Israel fighting Palestine, and all trends pointing to China trying to take over Taiwan in the near future. As a response to the situation, across the board, we're seeing the European continent focusing on rearming itself in preparation for a potential war and to fix the decades-long decline in Europe's collective firepower. But how Europe's military power deteriorated to this point, why 11 European countries are purchasing F-35s, and why most European countries produce and use the same 155mm artillery shell for their militaries, is not what you think. Everyone remembers the Cold War, when NATO and the Soviet Union were expected to fight it out in a war that would leave us all playing Fallout in real life. During that time, both the Soviet Union and Europe constructed massive armies with the latest and greatest military technology they could get their hands on. Thankfully, World War III never kicked off, but it left Europe with massive stockpiles of weapons and equipment. With the lack of an existential threat in their backyard, European nations no longer felt the need to spend significant chunks of their country's economies on the military. Plus, they still had all the leftover gear from the Cold War, so replacing perfectly good equipment wasn't a priority. But now, over 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and war raging on, Europe's military equipment has aged and more importantly, their ammunition stockpiles are running dry. The European nations have donated billions of dollars worth of arms, ammunition and equipment to Ukraine. But this has depleted ammo reserves at home. One specific area is with artillery ammunition. Most of Europe uses the NATO standard 155mm artillery shell but these have become dangerously scarce since the Russian invasion. At the start of 2022, European production of 155mm artillery shells hovered at about 230,000 rounds per year. In 2023, production increased to 400,000 annually, sparked by the Russian invasion. Europe is expected to hit 1 million artillery rounds per year by the end of 2024 and 2 million by 2026. However, the vast majority of these rounds are on their way to Ukraine, under the Act in Support of Ammunition Production Program, or ASAP. Most of Europe and NATO using the same 155mm artillery shell isn't just a coincidence. In the event of NATO's Article 5 being enacted, and all member states being brought into war at once, each of Europe's militaries will have to fight as a joint force not just as a collection of small armies, but essentially operating as one large army. This means that standardization of equipment is vital in order to ensure that logistics doesn't become a nightmare. NATO standardization allows for supplies from one country to be used by another. For example, the 5.56mm round fired from the British L85A3 is the same round fired from the French FAMAS and the German G36. But it's not just ammunition that's seeing standardization. Enter the F-35. NATO and EU members have recently spent significant amounts of money on bringing their air forces into the next generation, with more interoperability than ever before. 2024 marked the first year that NATO countries across the board hit the required 2% of GDP spending on defense, and much of that has gone towards upgrading their fleets of aircraft. So far, 600 F-35 Lightning II multi-role fighters have been ordered by a total of 11 European countries. Ten of these nations are part of NATO, with Switzerland's order of 36 being the odd one out. Spending $6.25 billion on fifth-generation fighter jets for the sake of neutrality is an interesting move for Switzerland, but I'm sure they have their reasons. 
The decision across the board to adopt the F-35 will help streamline logistics. This will allow for more flexibility with maintenance and provide redundancy for the different air forces if attrition rates begin to rise. The reason Europe has put a bigger emphasis on its air force is largely due to Russia's advantages in the world of hypersonic missiles, giving them the ability to strike targets too quickly to intercept. Buying stealth aircraft capable of carrying cruise missiles allows Europe to gain a similar ability to strike targets in contested airspaces without having to wait the years it will take to develop and build their own hypersonic arsenal, which they are doing too. In 2024, the UK pledged $1.26 billion towards the development of a domestically produced hypersonic missile with the goal of it being fully fielded by 2030. 90 different companies will be competing in order to deliver a hypersonic ballistic missile design. The European Defense Fund, or EDF, has allocated $1.2 billion with the intention of creating joint EU and NATO long-range fire capabilities, specifically in creating hypersonic missiles and counter-drone technology. Norway and Germany have also teamed up to create a joint hypersonic design known as the 3SM Turfing, designed as an anti-ship missile, but it won't be ready until 2035. As part of a larger strategy, Europe and NATO have been forced to address how they would keep supply lines open and operating if war were to break out on their eastern flank. This has led to the establishment of new land corridors, also known as ground lines of communications, which are large-scale multinational routes that are predetermined for moving troops from a naval port of entry all the way to the Russian and Ukrainian border. The goal in establishing these land corridors is to reduce the time and paperwork it takes to move soldiers from one nation to another. As of now, arriving militaries still have to operate within the framework of a host nation's legal jurisdiction, and this causes issues when the goal is to get to the front lines as fast as possible. One way NATO and European partners are trying to make fighting together a bit smoother is increasing both the frequency and size of their training exercises. One of these is Steadfast Defender, a yearly multinational training exercise that began in 2021. The focus of these exercises is rapid deployment of soldiers and equipment from their home bases to conflict hotspots farther east. Steadfast Defender 2024 was the largest military exercise in Europe since the Cold War, which involved 90,000 active military personnel from all 32 NATO countries. It saw the deployment of over 50 different naval vessels, 80 aircraft, and 1,100 combat vehicles. Because it's unrealistic for each country in Europe to fund an entirely flushed-out military that has the latest and greatest across the board, responsibilities have mostly been shared with each country specializing in one or two areas. For example, Norway has conducted international training in Arctic warfare since 2006, known as Nordic Response, and specializes in fighting in cold, harsh conditions and training other countries in how to do it as well. Estonia specializes in cybersecurity. Due to its proximity to Russia, it and the rest of Balkan states are subject to frequent cyber attacks from foreign actors. This led to the founding of NATO's head of cyber operations in Estonia's capital of Tallinn, and it regularly conducts research and development in the relatively new domain of cyber. Other specializations like increased airfields for allied air forces or multinational aerial refueling operations have been implemented across Europe in order to help share the load of collective defense. Recent reports show that NATO is only able to defend about 5% of its own airspace, leaving the vast majority of it uncontested. This has led to a focus on increasing a multi-layered air defense network, specifically around coastal areas. These include American Patriot and French SAMT batteries. 
Germany is currently leading an effort known as European Sky Shield Initiative, which is currently seeking out to develop a long-range air defense system specifically to defend against ballistic missiles. Of course, it wouldn't be a discussion on World War III without talking about the possibility of nuclear warfare. The use of nuclear bombs has been a constant talking point since the breakout of the war in Ukraine. Currently, the United Kingdom and France are the only two European countries with their own arsenal, with the UK owning about 225 warheads and the French with 290. However, the United States holds roughly 100 B-61 nukes across Netherlands, Germany, Italy and Turkey. The B-61s are smaller tactical nukes designed to hit high payoff military targets such as ports or naval strike groups. They are designed to be dropped from aircraft onto a target and can be carried by any of Europe's new F-35s if given the green light by the United States. With that said, Russia still sports the world's largest nuclear arsenal, with over 4,000 various warheads, vastly outnumbering the number of munitions held inside of Europe. Poland has requested that some of American's tactical nukes be held inside Poland, so they would serve as a greater deterrent closer to the Russian border. This was done after Russia confirmed that a number of nuclear warheads were transferred across the border into Belarus and to the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad. These decisions are still up in the air and would bring about serious threats of provocation from Russia. But the idea of Euronuke lives on. Whether or not nukes are once again back on the table, or if the war in Ukraine will spread west is yet to be seen. There are no signs of the invasion slowing down, and political relations continue to deteriorate between Europe and Russia. NATO's rearmament is a hopeful deterrence, but at the very least, they'll be more ready, if and when the time comes. <laughs>